Hi everyone, I'm Olga Villaverde. And I'm Amber Belt. Good morning and welcome to The Balancing Act. For over a century, Peter Pan has hooked audiences all over the world. Today our Broadway Across America series continues with Finding Neverland as we learn just what happens when you believe you can fly. And speaking of believing, the power of positive thinking, we're going to meet a man who's fighting Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a behind the mystery you don't want to miss. So if you need a little inspiration before you head out this morning, stay with us. The Balancing Act starts right now. Broadway Balances America brought to you by Broadway Across America, bringing the best of Broadway to a city near you. Time now for another installment of Broadway Balances America. Uh, and today we are flying to Neverland. Love it. At least metaphorically. <laughs> Based on the Academy Award winning film of the same name, Finding Neverland, it's an innovative musical, just beautiful, that features strong women both in front of and behind the scenes. Here inside Neverland. Packed with mesmerizing visuals, irresistible songs, and plenty of laughs, Finding Neverland is a timeless story about the power of imagination and spectacular proof that you never really have to grow up. It took courage for playwright J.M. Barry to stage his work for London theater goers in the early 1900s, but as history has proven, it was a risk worth taking. Finding Neverland is the story of how Peter became Pan, and if it weren't for J.M. Barry, and that writer's imagination and his courage to write something like nothing had written, been written before. You know, a story about a boy who wouldn't grow up, children who could fly, an island with mermaids and pirates where kids ruled the roost. Finding Neverland tells the story of how this classic story has come into our lives. Tony winner Diane Paulus knows a thing or two about staging a captivating play, and as J.M. Barry found out, it really does begin with the story. This theme of never growing up captures kids, captures adults. It certainly has captured me, you know, a mom in my 40s. I think it's this idea of what we have as children, an abandon, a, 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 an enjoyment of, of being in the moment of playing that we lose as we get older. And I think people have come to see Finding Neverland and I've seen them rediscover their inner child. It's the light in the eyes of my children. Laura Michelle Kelly originated the role of Sylvia Llewellyn Davis on Broadway. What I love about my character is that she's very forward thinking. You know, she's very, um, she's inappropriate for her time. She was born before her time. And she kind of stood up for the lives of her children. And um, that's what I love about her. She was a very progressive woman for her time. Another progressive woman is three-time Emmy Award-winning choreographer Mia Michaels, who is helping bring the story to a high-flying life. I think it comes from concept, it comes from story, it comes from character, it comes from music. Music for me is my biggest inspirational source. Um, it, it tells me the, the place in which I need to be, be, begin the creative process, the tone of it, the, the feel of it. Um, is it quirky? Is it, is it funny? Is it sad? Is it emotional? What, what is it moving? The collaboration of these three women on this original musical has proven moving indeed. I made Finding Neverland from my heart. This was a story that I wanted to give to audiences. And by audiences, I mean my own daughters, to parents, to people who are struggling in their life with how can they be their truest self? How can you redefine sense of family? How do you make it through a hard time? It's such a beautiful story where people really get to engage with what is on the other side of this life and what is it about our imagination that's so strong and powerful and how do you get in, awaken the child inside? And, and I think that's why people keep coming back again and again. Okay, well, one of the lyrics is when you believe you can fly. Yes. And I grew up watching, you know, iconic women as Peter Pan flying around the stage. Are we gonna see that in Finding Neverland? It's gonna be flying that is made by humans, people, 
people lifting people and it's much more organic and much more I find much more emotional because you see the humans lifting humans and they're flying and and you see the struggle of a human trying to lift another human and it comes from inside more than anything because if you if you believe you can you can now historically the role of Peter Pan has been played by iconic women like Mary Martin Kathy Rigby Sandy Duncan I don't suppose there's any shot for me. Hmm, maybe. Tinkerbell? Produced by Harvey Weinstein, with an original score by noted composer Gary Barlow and Grammy Award winner Elliot Kennedy, a book by celebrated playwright James Graham, the play within the play has universal appeal. Single, married, young or not, it's a story for all to enjoy. It's about feeling alive, whether you're a kid or you're an adult finding your inner child. So I'm hoping that audiences across America come to this show and use it as a place to touch your heart, feel alive, laugh and cry, be with your families, because it's a great show, you know, for kids, for grandparents, for parents. It's really a show that spans across ages in terms of its appeal. Please go see the show. It's a very, it's a very special show. It's not a typical Broadway show. It's not. The, the tone of it, the message of it, the spirit of it, the dance of it, it's very unique. It has its own Thing. And so to be able to share it with, you know, America, all, all across America is going to be incredible. The North American tour of Finding Neverland is headed to a theater near you. So check out Broadway Balances America, Broadway Across America, or go to our website, thebalancingact.com, for all the show information, tour dates, and more. It's sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease, named after the Yankees baseball player who is the first public figure to suffer from this debilitating condition. We're talking about ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a rare and rapidly progressive neurodegenerative disease for which there is no known cure. This month is ALS Awareness Month, and today we meet a patient who's living with the reality of ALS as we hear in his own words what it's like. It's a behind the mystery. Take a look. Well, when I get out of bed in the morning, the first challenge is how to get from a prone position to an upright position without using my hands or arms because that's where my weakness is. There are some things that I simply cannot do anymore. Um, it's actually been three years that I've been unable to button the, uh, the, the sleeve of my right wrist. Um, so I ask for assistance with that. My tea mug is very simply too heavy for me to lift. So my adaptation is I drink, through, drink it through a straw. The hardest thing for me to know is exactly when I'm going to stop being able to do things. I remember about a year ago <clears throat> identifying what I called the big four, which was the ability to drive, the ability to clean myself, to dress myself, and to feed myself. My name is Stephen Winthrop. Uh, I'm 58 years old. I was um, diagnosed with ALS at the end of 2013. ALS stands for a very complicated name called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, we call it ALS, it's less of a mouthful. Historically, it's been called Lou Gehrig's disease. Worldwide, it's often called motor neuron disease. ALS tends to strike you later in life. You've been healthy for, you know, decades. I mean, ALS does get diagnosed with people in their 20s, but historically it's more common to be diagnosed in your 40s or 50s, and symptoms come out of nowhere. My very first symptoms, they were nearly six years ago when I noticed some muscle twitching in my left forearm. Uh, no pain, just a, a twitch that wouldn't seemingly go away. But along the way, I, I discovered that a lot of the muscles in my left hand and left arm were weaker than the muscles in my right, which is particularly odd because I'm a lefty. 
Every story for an ALS patient is different, but they're all tragic outcomes. I mean, this is a relentless disease. Once symptoms start, it doesn't matter if it starts in your hands, your legs, ball bar, it, it is relentless. It progresses from that point on. And right now, we don't have an effective treatment that slows that process down. When we first were told definitively by a doctor that I had ALS, I had a pretty good idea that this was coming. The impact on me and my family when we got the news was um, devastating. My wife and I had two teenage daughters. The toughest day in my life was the, uh, the day, about four days after my diagnosis, when my wife and I sat down with our two kids and told them what ALS was. My advice for patients to prepare for what's going to happen in ALS is first of all to be, to be educated enough to really understand how, how hard it might be. If they're going to fight that battle to the end, then be prepared and understand to get ahead of every possible thing because the earlier you do interventions, the slower the disease is going to progress. It was within a few weeks of my diagnosis that my wife and I realized that we had to make some changes in our lives. And particularly the, the, the space we were living in. There were several features to the house, doors, windows, others that we deliberately designed to help me on my journey. The advice I would give to anybody uh, afflicted by ALS or a similar condition is to think about ease of movement through a space so we don't have any scatter rugs in the house. All it takes is a quarter of an inch to qualify as a tripping hazard. We don't have any thresholds that somebody could trip over. We have features like handrails on both sides of every stairwell. Many of the doors around the house um, have a sensor inside the wall. All I have to do is move my shoulder. So the sensors that are inside the walls will activate the motor that opens the door We've also incorporated a lot of very simple features in the house, having doorknobs that are not knobs, but levers. And also all of the outlets in the house are about 15 inches off the ground instead of being way down at shoe level. We wanted a space that would be easy for me to move through without using too much energy. So the earlier you can think about you know, how are you going to intervene? How are you going to keep your quality of life up? How are you going to keep your family involved with that? What do your caretakers need to look like? Uh, those are all decisions that they, people tend to try to make as early as they can to keep their quality of life up and be around with their family as long as they can. A qualified caretaker is an ALS patient's best friend. It's a critical component of your journey with ALS. The caregivers of people with ALS are the real heroes. My wife, her life has been permanently changed. The position that I'm in at this stage of the disease is that I know that's only gonna get harder with time. I do have hope that I will be alive to see the big breakthroughs that are, I think, really some of them just around the bend. I think patients like Stephen and, and the entire ALS community should have a lot of hope right now. We know more about this disease today than we did 10 years ago, and the information that we've accumulated in the last 10 years to understand this disease is larger than the previous 100 years of, of what we understood about ALS. So we are at the ALS Therapy Development Institute in Cambridge, Mass. We have 26,000 square feet of lab space. We're the largest research institute dedicated to finding a treatment and a cure for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. And that really has permeated the culture of ALS TDI for uh, since our inception. And we're recognized as the world leaders in the group that really systematically is trying to understand how ALS starts, how the symptoms first appear, how the disease progresses, and how we might develop potential treatments that was going to slow that process down and eventually lead to a cure. And because we understand the disease, we're much more rigorously testing potential treatments that could end up in patients. And I think we're going to start to see the first ones of those very, very soon. Anybody who's exposed to ALS wants to learn as much as they can about the disease as quickly as they can. The amount of, of, of knowledge and information that's out on the, uh, on the internet about 
ALS, it, there's more now than there ever has been. I mean, we have probably one of the most comprehensive websites around called ALS.net. It's a great resource to really understand what's going on in ALS today on a day-to-day -day basis. My message to patients when they come into the Institute recently after getting such a horrible diagnosis is to make a decision to have hope and battle this disease. It's not going to be an easy journey, but if you're prepared for the journey and if you get in front of those things before they happen, you're going to be a lot more prepared in your quality of life and the impact of your day-to-day -day life is going to be less. I have a lot of hope that because of what we know now about ALS compared to 10 or 20 years ago with the genetics and the better quality animal models that we're on the cusp, we're on the horizon of those first disease modifying treatments, which is very, very exciting. I am believe in the depths of my soul that there are people walking the planet today who are going to see ALS stopped. It's really just a question of when. No doubt a story filled with hope and so much important information that anyone can use who is living with ALS. And for more information on this rare disease, you can visit ALS.net to hear more from others with ALS. Or go to our website, thebalancingact.com. Stay with us. If you're buying a home for the first time, what happens? Oh, you probably get a headache, but you really don't have to. Welcome to our Mortgage 101 mini-series sponsored by Affinity Partnerships. And over the next few weeks, John Alexander and David Villarreal will be with us sharing their financial expertise. So good morning to both of you. Good morning to you. Gentlemen, I know I get it, headache, but it really doesn't have to be if you know what to expect, right? Yeah, I think if you're prepared and you understand what it is that you are going to be confronted with in terms of your credit, in terms of documentation, it should be a fairly simple process. And there's the finances, but more to just finances, right? Well, there is. I mean, you need to decide what you're trying to go after, but, you know, the documentation, the process, getting your taxes together, getting your W-2s will really make this a actually a pleasant experience if you don't allow yourself to get intimidated. And something that one has to think about is their credit. That's a huge thing. The credit's always an issue, but I think when you are with a mortgage professional that can assist you in terms of qualifying and or remedying some of the situations with your credit, it's also going to be a worthwhile opportunity. And what about down payment? Well, down payment assistance is available throughout the country, and that is meant to direct you in an effort to purchase your home without having to have issues trying to raise the money for that down payment. So bottom line, for anyone who wants to get that first home and live that dream, it is possible. It doesn't have to be a headache. It can be easy. And pleasant. It doesn't have to be a stressful experience. Just, you know, gather your information, your taxes, your documentation, and by the way, enjoy the process. Ask questions. Have a good time. I enjoyed it with you guys today. Thank you so much for being here. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. We'll Thank see you. each other soon. Yes. You bet. And to find out more about Affinity Partnership at their site, just go to affinityps.com or our website, thebalancingact.com. Travel Tips, brought to you by Sunoco, on the racetrack or the road home. Driving at night comes with many distractions. One of the most prominent, high beams flashing in your eyes. Bright lights coming at you or from behind are annoying and dangerous. Adjust your headlights so you're not blinded by oncoming traffic and vice versa. Don't stare into oncoming traffic. Instead, turn your gaze away from other approaching car and truck lights. Bright dash lights distract vision, making it hard to see what's in front of you. So use the dimmer switch. Clean all mirrors. Dirty mirrors diffuse the light from cars behind you, producing glare, making it harder to see. One of the most important, take frequent breaks. An alert driver is a safer driver. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next time. And remember, happy trails. Travel Tips has been brought to you by Sunoco. On the racetrack or the road home. Sunoco, fueling victories every day. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, hopefully you got a little bit of inspiration for your morning. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can head to our Facebook page and our website. We've got lots more inspiration there. See you next time.